I'm going to ask you uh, to fill in a gap here. Don't think too hard about it. Democracy is, pick the word. <laughs> this is what I assumed most of you would say. Um, I was going to get to that point later. Uh, of course, I think if you're like a, a, a refugee from an autocratic regime, you probably come here and thinking freedom, liberty, equality, all these beautiful ideals. Then I was going to say, I assume you guys probably think it's fucked. Um, and of course, maybe there's a few technocrats who are like, democracy means elections, or democracy is the system of governance or something. I don't know. Um, I'm glad you got there. Uh, I'm not actually going to do my usual spiel about what the Sortition Fund does, what c uh, citizens' assemblies are. I'm going to throw quotes at you, because I'm a person who collects quotes. don't know what that means that I am. The first one is from about 2,500 years ago. It is thought to be democratic for the officers of constitutional government to be assigned by lot, for them to be elected oligarchic. In the birthplace of democracy, democracy meant lottery, meant random selection. Election meant oligarchy. 2,000 years later, Montesquieu. Selection by lot is in the nature of democracy. Selection by choice is in the nature of aristocracy. Or Rousseau. The drawing of lots is more in the nature of democracy. In an aristocracy, voting is appropriate. For 2,000 years, democracy meant random selection. Election meant aristocracy. What happened? Well, there's a couple of wars, a couple of big wars. One of those ones, and there's one over here as well. They cut lots of heads off, they got rid of the aristocracy, all that kind of stuff. And the thinkers, uh, the, the, the men who won these revolutions, the rich men who won these revolutions, they said, how should we organize ourselves? How should we make decisions? And they'd read their Rousseau, they'd read their Montesquieu. So they chose elections. After the American Revolution, about 6% of the population could vote. They were all rich men. There were actually uh, tax... You had to pay a certain minimum amount of taxes to be able to vote across most of the states. In the French Revolution, afterwards... I mean, it's very complex, but um, they had a different constitution every couple of years. But they had this concept, active citizenship, which meant that you actually had an active financial stake in the state. You had to pay a certain number of taxes to vote. It was very exclusionary. Jean-Paul Marat, famous French radical, said he recognized, what the hell are we doing? We're cutting the heads off the, off the um, rich by uh, hereditary, by, by birth, and we're going to destroy that aristocracy of birth and replace it with an aristocracy of the rich. He got stabbed in his bathtub for that. Bah. Okay, it wasn't only for that. You may think that Jean-Paul Marat said, oh, he's just some radical French uh, Democrat, so let's go to this radical John Adams. He looks pretty radical, doesn't he? Second U.S. President, is not representation an essential and fundamental departure from democracy? Is not every representative government in the universe an aristocracy? He would say that, because at that time, only the rich could vote, and the rich men could vote. Some people didn't like that, the fact that only rich men could vote. Women? Ah, oh, my, my font's all broken. That's all right, should have picked that up. We're here not because we are law breakers. We're here in our efforts to become law makers. Emmeline Pankhurst, suffragette. And the other one, I just like the, the quote, actually. The argument of the broken window pane is the most valuable argument in modern politics. I think Extinction Rebellion is building on that idea. Not that they're going to break windows, of course. Um, not about direct action. Men and women of color in the U.S. didn't like the fact that it only... White people could vote down south. The most decisive steps in that little walk to the, is that little walk to the voting booth. That is an important step. We've got to gain the ballot and through that gain political power. Everyone assumed that if we all can get the vote, it'll all be fine. Well, not everyone. Some people disagreed. Emma Goldman, if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal, she thought. At the era where women were winning the vote, 1918 here in the UK, some women won the vote. 1928, they got equality. Women were even allowed in the House of Lords in the 40s. Are we to assume that the poison already inherent in politics would be decreased if women were to enter the political arena? Is woman, in places where she can vote, no longer considered a mere sex commodity? I'll let you answer that. Because luckily, here in the UK, 
you've surpassed Afghanistan in 2015. Well done. Well done. Great. I mean, there's a very clear reason why Afghanistan had 28% of the women in parliament. I'll let you research that. Uh, this graph is from the US Congress a few years ago. It's got slightly better. If you look at the UK graph, it's roughly the same for the House of Commons. If you had the House of Lords, whoa, <laughs> you're talking lots of old men. Um, not all of them, of course, just most of them. Elections were never meant to be a democratic device. They were, me they were an aristocratic device. So what to do? Direct democracy? Everyone should vote in everything. Or deliberation and sortition in, in citizens' assemblies. So direct democracy, more referendums. They seem to be working pretty well. <laughs> what about Clement Attlee? I could not consent to the introduction into our political life of a device so alien to all our traditions as the referendum, which has only too often been the instrument of Nazism and fascism. Hitler liked referendums. Let you think about that. So what's the other option? Sortition plus deliberation. What is this word, sortition? It's just a technical name for random selection. I just don't like using the word random. It has lots of negative connotations. Man, that was random. You know, so no. Sortition just means random selection. You randomly select a representative bunch of people and bring them together in a citizen's assembly. I'm not actually going to talk much about Citizens' Assembly. After the break, I'm doing a, a, a mock Citizens' Assembly. If you participate in that, or you can you know, look at our website, etc. You can, you can find that out. But it's essentially that you randomly select a broadly represented bunch of people, bring them together in an informed and deliberative environment. It's very artificial. It's not public opinion. It's not what people do think, but what they would think, is what I say. Uh, the UK is about to have a citizens' assembly on climate change. I understand completely it doesn't satisfy XR's um, demands, but we're about to find out what a randomly selected representative bunch of UK citizens thinks about the climate crisis. It's kicking off in January. What I will do is let you listen to someone who was randomly selected and participated in one of these events. It was actually a citizens' jury which is just a small-scale version of a citizens' assembly. Instead of 50, 100 more people, it's like 20 people. Here's what she had to say. Well, I hope that enough of what's taken place has been recorded so we can actually take that to MPs, MSPs, and show them what can happen if you get ordinary people in, sharing expertise, different mindsets, and, do you know, I think the biggest thing is that there's been a huge amount of co cooperation happening between human beings this morning. And I think parliaments can learn a lot from that, that it is possible to sit down and discuss um, issues that people have got very conflicting thoughts about and come to agreements and do it all in a really civilised, human way with a lot of respect for each other and, um, dare I say it, love, uh, love for the subject, for making the world a better place. For making the world a better place. This is what you get when you use citizens' assemblies. But how do we get there? We've got an electoral system. How could we get to a system that relies or institutionalises citizens' assemblies? Now, I'm not going to talk about theories of change and political strategy. Um, I'm just going to throw more quotes at you. Milton Freeman. I love Milton Freeman. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> only a crisis, actual or perceive, perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. This is our basic function. So here's the godfather of neoliberalism, for those who don't know. To develop alternatives, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And then Thatcher and Reagan came along. Keep the ideas alive. It is actually a theory of change. Get ready for the crisis. Have them ready. Okay, I'm kind of cheating. This is a, a traditional poem, but I first heard it on a, a poem, sorry, a traditional prayer, but I first heard it on a Sinead O'Connor album. God grant me the serenity to, to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, 
and the wisdom to know the difference. Unless, of course, you're a Black Panther and active in Black Lives Matter. I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. Angela Davis. Or, of course, the classic, Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Hope is not something that you have. Hope is something that you create with your actions. I like it. Unless, of course, you're Greta. I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day, and then I want you to act. You might think that citizens' assemblies are too utopian, that how do we, you know, it's impossible. Well, I'm jumping back. Victor Hugo, today's utopia is the flesh and blood of tomorrow. We have hope. Some guy, Brett Hennig. The tantalizing possibility that we can govern ourselves has presented itself. We no longer need politicians to do it for us. It is time for the end of politicians and for us to become the next wave in the ongoing struggle to demand real democracy. Now. Thanks.